I've never believed in ghosts until the summer I turned 15. That was the year my parents decided to move us to an old house on the outskirts of Willow's End, a small town whispered about in the neighboring cities for its odd disappearances and ancient legends. The house, an imposing structure with gnarled ivy creeping up its stone walls, stood isolated at the end of a winding dirt road, encircled by a dense forest that seemed to swallow light whole. The first night in our new home, as I unpacked, the air grew inexplicably cold. I shivered, pulling my sweater tighter around me, when suddenly, a soft whisper floated through the room. Leave, it breathed, almost inaudible. I spun around, my heart hammering in my chest, but no one was there. Just the old, dusty books and the creaking wooden floor. Thinking it was just my imagination, fueled by the eerie tales I'd heard at the local diner, I brushed it off and continued unpacking. Days passed with minor, unexplainable incidents. Doors would slam shut, lights flickered without reason, and the night was filled with sounds of something, or someone, pacing the hallways. My parents dismissed my fears, attributing everything to the house settling or the wind. But I knew it was something more, something darker. One particularly stormy night, when the winds howled like the cries of the damned, I lay in bed, unable to sleep. The shadows cast by the tree branches tapping against my window danced across the room. That's when I saw it. A figure, pale and ethereal, stood by my closet, watching me. Its eyes, dark hollows in a gaunt face, pierced through the darkness, sending a chill down my spine. I blinked, and it was gone. I was left staring at the empty space, my mind racing with fear. The next morning, I decided to investigate the history of our home. The local library held stacks of old newspapers and books that smelled of mold and forgotten stories. After hours of digging, I uncovered chilling articles and obituaries that told tales of previous occupants who had disappeared without a trace, believed to have been consumed by the house itself. Each story ended with a warning, a plea from past residents to avoid the cursed property. Fueled by a mix of dread and curiosity, I explored every inch of the house. In the attic, under a loose floorboard, I found a dusty old journal, its pages yellowed and brittle. The journal belonged to a woman named Eliza, who lived in the house during the late 1800s. Her writings detailed her growing terror and despair, haunted by visions and voices that drove her to madness. Her final entry was a frantic scribble, it never stops watching. That night, determined to uncover the truth, I set up a camera in my room and tried to catch some sleep. At around 3 a.m., a cold breeze woke me. The room was ice cold, and my breath formed clouds in the air. The camera's light blinked red, recording. I felt eyes on me, watching, waiting. I turned slowly towards the closet, and there, the figure stood again, more distinct this time, its features twisted in agony. It pointed towards the wall, a silent gesture filled with urgency. I approached, hesitantly, and pressed against the old plaster. It crumbled easily under my touch, revealing a hidden compartment. Inside, I found another journal and a small, antique mirror. The journal was written by a man named Thomas, Eliza's husband, who confessed to using dark rituals to bind a malevolent spirit to the mirror to gain immortality. But instead of granting him eternal life, the spirit cursed the house, trapping all who lived there. As I read, the temperature dropped further, and the mirror's surface fogged up as if breathing. A face appeared, contorted with malice, and then, a voice, deep and echoing, filled the room. Free us, it demanded. I dropped the journal, my mind racing. The house, the disappearances, the voices, everything was connected to this cursed mirror. I knew what I had to do, but the cost could be my soul. Grabbing the mirror, I ran downstairs, the voice growing louder, the whispers turning into screams. As I reached the front door, the house trembled, the walls groaning under an unseen force. The door slammed shut, locking me inside. I was trapped, with the mirror in my hands and the spirits of the house closing in. 
They wailed and howled, a symphony of the damned, as the darkest hour approached. I braced myself, knowing that what I was about to do could either free me or bind me to the house forever. The clock struck midnight, and the house fell silent, breathlessly waiting for my next move. With the clock's last chime still echoing in the air, the oppressive silence that followed was almost suffocating. The shadows in the corners of the room seemed to stretch and writhe as if animated by a life of their own. I clutched the ancient mirror tightly, its cold surface biting into my palms, and whispered, what do you want from me? As if in response, the air grew colder, and a low moan vibrated through the room. The surface of the mirror shimmered, and a ghostly apparition appeared, its face twisted in torment. Break the curse, it hissed, its voice a mixture of pleading and command. How? I managed to ask, my voice barely above a whisper. Free our souls, the spirit replied, fading in and out of visibility. Destroy the mirror. I glanced down at the ornate frame, its silver tarnished by age, the glass fogged as if it breathed. It seemed alive, pulsing with a malevolent energy. Every instinct screamed at me to throw it, to shatter it against the hard floor, but hesitation gripped me. Destroying the mirror was not a simple task, the journal had mentioned protective charms and rituals that bound the spirit. I feared unleashing something far worse by breaking it unprepared. As I pondered my next move, the temperature plummeted further, and my breath fogged in the frigid air. The house groaned ominously, and the wind outside picked up howling like a banshee. The atmosphere was charged with a palpable tension, an electric fear that tingled along my skin. Suddenly, the mirror grew hot in my hands, too hot to hold, and I dropped it with a yelp. It hit the floor with a threatening crack, but did not break. From the fractured glass, a multitude of ghostly faces pressed against the surface, their expressions contorted with anguish and rage. Help us, they whispered in unison, a chorus of despair that filled the room. I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest, and bumped into something solid. Whirling around, I faced another apparition, this one clearer, more solid than the others. It was a woman in a tattered Victorian dress, her face pale and eyes hollow. She looked at me with a desperate, piercing gaze. Eliza? I guessed remembering the name from the journal. Yes, she nodded, her voice a melancholic melody. It is I. You must break the curse with a pure heart and a will strong enough to withstand the darkness. Only then can our souls rest. The rituals written by my husband, they are in the journal. Follow them and free us. But if I do this, what will happen to me? I asked fear nodding my stomach. There is always a price, Eliza said, her eyes sad. But you have the power to end our suffering. Without your help, we are doomed to remain here, trapped between worlds, forever. I took a deep breath, absorbing the weight of her words. The responsibility was immense, the danger, undeniable. Yet, the resolve hardened within me. I couldn't leave these tortured souls to their eternal torment. Show me what to do, I said firmly. Eliza nodded and motioned for me to follow her to the library. We passed through the dark, oppressive hallways of the house, the air thick with whispers and cries of the unseen. In the library, she pointed to a heavy book on the top shelf. The rituals are there, she said. Prepare yourself for tonight you will either be our savior or join us in perpetual darkness. The book was old, its leather cover cracked and pages yellowed. I opened it, and the handwriting was difficult to decipher, the language archaic. I spent hours poring over the text, trying to understand the intricate details of the ritual that needed to be performed. Outside, the storm raged fiercer, as if trying to deter me from my task. The house seemed to shake with anger, or perhaps fear, as if it knew its end was near. Shadows flickered and danced on the walls, and the air was heavy with a foreboding sense of dread. As midnight approached, I gathered the necessary ingredients, candles made from beeswax, a circle of salt, 
and an iron dagger as specified in the book. I set them up in the main hall, where the mirror lay. The faces in the glass watched me, their eyes filled with a mix of hope and terror. The clock began to chime, marking the late hour, as I started the incantation. The words felt strange on my tongue, a language forgotten by time, but powerful enough to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. The wind screamed outside, and the house trembled under the force of the storm. As I continued the ritual, the atmosphere changed, the air electrified with energy. The mirror pulsed, the glass vibrating with the force of the trapped souls. I could feel their desperation, their pain, as they pushed against their prison, yearning for release. I reached the climax of the ritual, the final words that would break the curse or damn me forever. My voice rose above the storm, strong and clear, carrying the weight of my determination. The mirror's surface cracked, spiderwebs of glass racing across its face. And then, everything stopped. The storm ceased, the house stilled, and the silence was absolute. The mirror stood before me, a fractured portal between realms, its fate, and mine, hanging in the balance. The eerie stillness was more frightening than any cacophony of supernatural screams or the howling of the wind outside. A heavy, suffocating silence enveloped the room, and the air grew thick, charged with a tension that felt almost solid. The broken mirror lay ominously on the floor, a jagged testament to the ritual I had performed. The fractured glass seemed to stare up at me, dark and foreboding. In the profound quiet, a slow, deliberate creaking sound began to echo through the house. The walls themselves seemed to groan under the weight of centuries of trapped despair and darkness. My heart pounded in my chest, each beat loud in my ears, as I stepped cautiously towards the mirror. As I approached, the air grew inexplicably colder, a chill that seeped into my bones. My breath misted in the air forming clouds that swirled mysteriously before dissipating into the shadowy corners of the room. I could feel the eyes of the house upon me, watching, waiting to see what would come of my actions. From the fractured depths of the mirror, a low, mournful wail began to rise. It started as a whisper, barely audible, but grew in intensity until it filled the room, a sound so full of anguish and sorrow that it made my soul ache. The spirits were stirring, their voices melding into a chorus of the damned, crying out for release or perhaps revenge. The candle flames flickered wildly as a gust of wind, from nowhere and everywhere, swept through the room. The pages of the ritual book rustled and turned as if invisible fingers were searching for something forgotten. My eyes were drawn to a specific page, glowing faintly with an eerie light. The text shimmered revealing a hidden script that had been invisible before, a final piece of the incantation necessary for the completion of the ritual. With a trembling hand, I read the glowing words aloud, their ancient syllables strange and powerful. The ground beneath my feet vibrated, and the house seemed to pulse with a life force of its own. The spirits in the mirror swirled in a frenzied dance, their faces contorted in expressions of pain and hope. Suddenly, the mirror shattered completely, the pieces flying apart with explosive force. I shielded my face with my arms, but not before seeing a blinding light erupt from within the glass. The light was pure and white, cutting through the darkness like a sword. The wailing of the spirits reached a deafening crescendo, then cut off abruptly. Silence fell once again, heavy and absolute. I lowered my arms slowly, my heart racing with fear and anticipation. Where the mirror had been, there was now only a pile of glittering dust. But the air, the air felt different. Lighter, somehow, as if a great weight had been lifted from the very atmosphere of the house. A soft, almost imperceptible whisper brushed against my ear. Thank you, it sighed, the voice ethereal and fading. I spun around, searching the shadows that clung to the corners of the room. There was nothing to see, but I felt a presence, a warmth that hadn't been there before. The spirits were free, their centuries of torment ended by the shattering of the cursed mirror. But as the initial relief washed over me, a cold realization crept into my mind. The ritual had freed the spirits, yes, but had it truly cleansed the house of its dark past? 
Or had I unleashed something even darker into the world? The house creaked ominously, as if in answer to my unspoken question, and somewhere, far off in the distance, I heard the faint sound of laughter, dark and mocking. A shiver ran down my spine, and I knew deep in my bones that while this chapter had ended, the story was far from over. The house held more secrets, more shadows to explore, and the night was still young. As I stood there, pondering my next move, the wind picked up once more, whispering through the trees outside, calling to me, urging me onward into the darkness that awaited. As the mocking laughter echoed through the stillness of the house, a chill enveloped my heart. It seemed the spirits, though released, had left behind a residue of their centuries-old torment. The house, alive and whispering, seemed reluctant to let go of its dark narrative. With each step I took, the wooden floors groaned underfoot, as if protesting my presence. The shadows, darker now, clung to the walls with a desperate tenacity. I could feel the gaze of something unseen, a presence that watched from the darkness, its intentions unreadable. Determined to confront whatever remained, I moved deeper into the house. The air grew oppressively heavy, thick with a dread that seemed almost tangible. As I approached the library, the sight of many restless nights and eerie whispers, the temperature dropped sharply. My breath appeared before me in a cloud of frost, and the faint glow of the moonlight filtered through the cracked window pane, casting ghostly silhouettes. In the library, the book that had guided my ritual lay open on the floor, its pages fluttering as if caught in a silent storm. Drawn to it, I knelt down and noticed that the glowing script had faded, leaving behind only the ancient, ink-stained text. It felt as though the book had expended its energy, its purpose fulfilled with the freeing of the spirits. But the laughter continued, a sound not just heard, but felt, a vibration that seemed to emanate from the very walls of the house. Who are you? What do you want? I demanded, my voice steady despite the fear that knotted my stomach. The laughter stopped abruptly, and a voice, deep and resonant, replied from the shadows, freedom is a lie. I turned towards the sound, peering into the dark corners of the room. There, in the shadows, a figure slowly materialized. Not a ghost, but something older, a darkness given form. It was tall, its shape humanoid but twisted, features blurred as if constantly in motion. Why haunt this place? I asked, a part of me wanting to flee, yet knowing I must face this final specter. The house feeds, it said, its voice a whisper of leaves against stone. It feeds on fear, on life. The spirits were but morsels. It wants more. Realization dawned on me, cold and bleak. The house itself was the entity, a collector of souls, its hunger insatiable. The mirror had been a prison, yes, but also a shield, containing the house's true nature. What can end this? I asked, a plan forming in my mind. Nothing ends, the figure replied. But you can seal it, bind it as the mirror once did. How? I demanded. Confront it. Claim it as your own, it said before dissolving back into the darkness from which it had come. Taking a deep breath, I stood and walked to the center of the library. I spoke aloud, my voice echoing in the empty room, I claim this house, not with fear, but with courage. You will hold no more souls, no more fear. The house shook, a roar filling the air, as if in defiance. But I continued, you are mine now. I will be your keeper, not your victim. As I spoke, the atmosphere changed. The heavy air lifted slightly, and the oppressive darkness receded. The house, my house now, quieted, its sinister presence diminishing. It was still there, lurking in the shadows, but contained, controlled. I left the library, feeling the weight of my new responsibility. The house was quiet, subdued. As I stepped outside, the first light of dawn was breaking across the horizon. The darkness had lifted, and with it, the pervasive sense of dread. I knew the fight wasn't over, that the house would always be a place of power and danger. 
but for now, it was enough to know that I had confronted the darkness and emerged not victorious, but at peace. Walking away from the house, I looked back once, seeing it not as a place of fear, but as a challenge, a responsibility I had accepted. The sun rose, casting golden light over the land, and I felt a cautious hope. The night had ended, and with it, the darkest hour had passed. The house stood silent, a sentinel on the horizon, watching, waiting, but no longer hunting.